Our next paper is paper number 71F, Kinetic Studies and Surface Characterization of Copper Cobalt Catalyst for Higher Alcohol Synthesis. Our speakers, our authors, are G.L. Griffin and W.X. Penn. This work was performed at Louisiana State University, and our speaker is Professor Greg Griffin. He received his B.S. at California Institute of Technology and his Ph.D. at Princeton University, and he's presently associate professor at LSU. Professor Griffin. Thank you, Professor. Do we have a hand microphone? There's a lot of competition for next door. Those of you that heard Richard Tucker's talk last night <clears throat> heard that one of the four frontier areas is catalyst design or designer catalyst. Speaking uh, perhaps a bit more conservatively, we're also aware that the traditional approach to, catalyst, to systematic catalyst development is to uh, hope at least to take something we know about a catalyst that works and try to extend it uh, at least incrementally uh, to something new test the hypothesis. So that is basically the spirit of the research that I'm going to describe to you today. We have done a great deal of work on the methanol synthesis catalyst, which is commercially well known, a copper zinc oxide system. It is also known that cobalt, homogeneous phase, uh, is a catalyst for methanol homologation to higher alcohols. And so the question that we posed was whether you could combine the two features into a single uh, two-component bimetallic catalyst and hope to accomplish the direct conversion of CO and hydrogen into higher alcohols. Catalyst preparation is a conventional approach, co-precipitation in the mixed metal nitrates, acidify to get them into solution. We followed literature, published literature preparation methods initially for our copper zinc oxide catalyst for methanol studies. At that point, we discovered that the sequence of addition of sodium carbonate precipitating agent to the metal nitrates has a significant effect on the quality of the catalyst. Uh, in fact, to attain high metal surface areas, uh, we obtained the best results by simultaneous co-precipitation, dropwise addition of the base and metal nitrate salt together into a mixed beaker. This accomplishes the precipitation at neutral pH and leads to uh, equal rates for the precipitation of the various metallic components. Uh, following that, we go through the standard <coughs> washing, drying, calcining, studied catalyst with or without alkali metal. The alkali is introduced at the end step. And finally, the reduction step. For copper zinc oxide, the reduction uh, gives rise to a single water evolution peak at around 130 degrees C. For the mixed copper cobalt catalyst, we see a slight delay in that first reduction peak, 5 or 10 degrees or so. And finally, a second reduction peak beginning at about 190 degrees C continuing through 225, which is the highest temperature we use for reduction step. The reaction system is straightforward. The sole comment I would add is that we will come back at the end to mentioning some homologation test experiments <coughs> in addition to the standard flow through with pressure letdown and GC analysis. We have a bubbler trap added into the line for inserting uh, methanol or ethanol to test homologation kinetics. The characterization tool that we're primarily interested in through this work was temperature program desorption. Our reason for that is that we know the behavior of probe molecules, hydrogen and CO, on the copper zinc oxide system. We 
can find literature references uh, somewhat more limited to the behavior on cobalt systems. The temperatures are sufficiently different that we believe we had a reasonable chance of identifying the two separate sites. In essence, a selective chemisorption technique applied to a bicomponent system. The result here was from earlier work looking at the copper zinc oxide system. This is hydrogen desorption from the, that material. It's characterized by a single well-defined peak coming off slightly above 300 degrees C. Uh, I've not attempted, I'm not going to talk about the uh, interpretation of that in terms of an activation energy uh, in light of the comments that we've had before. We then go on to look at the copper cobalt system. We see that in fact, we have, do have the same peak temperature, which we can assign to the hydrogen desorbing copper component of this catalyst. And although you need to work at it uh, in the sense that it is an activated absorption process, we do resolve a separate high temperature peak that can be assigned to the cobalt sites in this catalyst. We attempt to do a qualitative calibration. The surface area of the copper peak corresponds to about 30 square meters per gram. The surface area of the hydrogen on the cobalt corresponds to about 7 uh, square meters per gram. The reason, to that, the reason for that difference, despite the similar working intensities, is that the absorption of hydrogen on copper appears to cover only about a quarter of the site's saturation. Similar strategy works out for CO absorption as the probe molecule. Here again showing earlier results for CO absorption on the copper zinc oxide system. <coughs> you can see a well resolved peak. CO is a bit more complicated. It has the advantage that it does titrate the copper sites closer to one to one stoichiometry. The disadvantage is the binding energy is very weak, quite similar to the absorption energy on the zinc oxide component. And so if you lower the <coughs> put too much CO down, you begin to populate uh, substrate sites as well. So that makes us a bit uncomfortable. There. That shows up a bit more. When we move on to the bicomponent system, here this is substrate CO. This shoulder here, CO coming off of the copper component. And again, a higher temperature state, not observed, on a copper zinc oxide system that we can attribute to CO absorption on the cobalt system. Again, you can quantitatively pull out component surface areas. This was about 25 square meters per gram now. Slight difference from the hydrogen result. The cobalt interpretation is complicated by the fact that the absorption stoichiometry of CO on cobalt uh, is known to be a function of the, of the cobalt dispersion. For atomically dispersed cobalt, you can have more than one CO absorbed per site. Uh, for lower surface area cobalt, you have to discuss the dichotomy between bridged and linear sites, for example. For the case of the CO absorption, we can complement with absorption GPD work with infrared spectroscopy by looking at the CO bands. So here I show a series series of spectra representing a <coughs> program desorption in red uh, sequence. The upper curve shows the results for adsorption of CO at 150K, considered that starting point, the initial photograph. We resolve at least two, possibly three sites. We have the 2090 band. That can be attributed to CO absorbed on high Miller index copper sites. Uh, that was also seen on pure uh, binary copper zinc oxide catalysts. I didn't put a spectrum of that in. <coughs> Moving uh, down in wave number, there's a band at 2060. That could be attributed either to the 111 surface of copper, which we do not believe to be the case, or to multi-molecular absorption of CO on dispersed cobalt sites. That would be by analogy with cobalt carbonyl infrared spectrum. We do believe that that is the case. The third peak around 1974 may or may not be, uh, may or may not believe that's present in a low temperature experiment. As we go ahead and warm up the surface, <coughs> pass through 300 degrees Kelvin, the CO leaves the copper sites. We're left with 
the now 1974 ban. Uh, that, we believe, is due to linearly absorbed CO on these dispersed cobalt sites. We go out to 1800. Uh, we had looked beyond that. In fact, we see no evidence for bridging CO, which tells us that we do not have large regions of cobalt present on this catalyst. So putting together the infrared and TPD evidence, we think that the picture of the catalyst surface is essentially one of an intimately or molecularly mixed copper cobalt alloy. The second part of what I want to talk about is the kinetic studies. Here we show first the overall conversion, fractional conversion of CO as a function of space time through the reactor. You can note that we're getting up to close to 80% conversion. Despite this, the doubt appears to be fit by a straight line, implying apparent zero order kinetics. And so we felt relatively comfortable with going ahead. Uh, continuing the kinetic analysis. Starting far back with the telescope and focusing in, I first show the product type distribution. The top part of this graph shows the methanol yield in this catalyst. Selectivity compared to the previous graph is about 12%, 12% carbon selectivity in methanol. That's uh, somewhat lower than the IFP group's reports for their copper cobalt system. The middle section shows the hydrocarbons. We see that at low space velocities, uh, there's uh, very little hydrocarbon formation. Uh, in fact, we're doing better than IFP had reported. At uh, longer residence times, we see uh, an increase, obviously, convex upward, uh, increase in the rate of hydrocarbon formation. Uh, that is consistent with uh, personal communications I've gotten from uh, Craig Murchison and the Dow Company, and their work. Finally, uh, the greatest interest here, the bottom section shows the higher alcohol yield. This corresponds to about 50% carbon selectivity to the higher alcohols uh, on this catalyst. Higher alcohols here is defined as C2 to C6 OH. They all appear to be uh, linear and primary alcohols. To put things in perspective briefly here, the rate of formation of these alcohols is similar to what has been reported both by the IFP copper cobalt work and also to uh, the rates reported by Dow for their moly disulfide catalysts. Focusing the microscope in a little closer, we now break down the individual alcohol components. For completion, the methanol is shown here. For the chain propagation uh, argument, of course, it's only the ethanol through hexanol that we're interested in. We see, again, approximately zero, approximately first order linear kinetics through here. That means we can interpret the slopes of those lines as the rates of formation for the alcohols. So we can generate a schultz flory plot. Thank you, Ralph. Generate a schultz flory plot for the alcohol component shown along the top. It is a coincidence that the uh, methanol point uh, lies collinear with the rest of the higher alcohols. For completeness, I've shown the paraffins and olefin yield. Recall that there was the nonlinear behavior in the yields. And so I don't believe that we're in a position at this point to interpret those results as a rigorous schultz lawyer parameter. I'll come back to make some comments about the mechanism and rate expression at the end. Looking now at the termination step for this modified fischer tropsch process, here I'm plotting the yield of the particular alcohol, the given chain length, relative to everything else that's produced beyond that. So it's a selectivity plot. It's the selectivity for the termination of the alcohol to the alcohol product as a function of W over F in the reactor. 
we see that selectivity is changing. The correlation here is drawn with W over F. Obviously, we believe physically that change is going to be due to a change in reaction conditions, not simply how long the material is sitting in the reactor. The major operating parameter that we see changing is the composition of the feed stream. Remember, we got up to 80% conversion in these results. Because of the volume dilation of the system, we don't see 80% changes in either of the reactant concentrations. Uh, there is a decrease, of course, in the hydrogen and CO. Interestingly, the hydrogen CO ratio is about one to one throughout. So we don't think that that's the primary factor. We do see, I'll move it up, losing the title, that the CO2 concentration is building up uh, as the reaction conversion increases. CO2 is the major um, splitting product. Water uh, is observed about a factor of 10 below uh, the CO2 yield. CO2 is the major product, byproduct formed. CO2 is not formed uh, at the rate predicted, or the rate that would correspond to equilibrium for the water gas shift reaction. And so we're not really in a position to make comments about the kinetics of the water gas shift process. We're in that no man's land in between the two limiting cases. But this suggests, and there um, is some reference in the methanol work as well, that the presence of CO2, if you like, as an oxidizing species, is affecting the selectivity of the termination reaction, at least in this case. <coughs> but we can test that directly. In fact, we had done it two ways. I had mentioned the reduction step, uh, the fact that reduction did not go to completion uh, by 225 degrees, in which we stopped the reduction, uh, pre-reduction step. When we switched to reaction conditions, there's about a 10-hour break-in period, which we attribute to continued reduction of the system. Here we tested directly by pre-oxidizing the catalyst deliberately, then switching to reaction conditions. We see the same thing. There's about 10 hours during which in particular, the methane yield is hyperactive, if you like, and then drops off. <coughs> and so we believe the two pieces of evidence together suggest that the presence of a partially oxidized surface, or at least a surface which is modified by virtue of the presence of ox oxygen or an oxidizing species in the reactive gas, is contributing to a change in selectivity. It's ironic that as it becomes more reduced, there's less of the hydrocarbon but interestingly, that's also observed in one of Clear's papers for the methanol reaction, that most selective of alcohol catalysts. At high CO2, he reports the term for methane formation. Finally, the last piece of evidence I want to discuss is with regard to a direct test of the homologation proposal. We've seen a few slides ago that the alcohol yields are consistent with a chain growth model. Now we want to, to test the insertion, go back to that initial idea of whether, in fact, uh, this catalyst is behaving by virtue of the copper component making the methanol, the cobalt com component, then converting that methanol into the higher alcohols. Well, that's not what happens. The first column here shows the base set of conditions. Uh, no ethanol added or methanol added into the bubbler. So focus on the W over F value and the uh, propanol from ethanol value. Moving over to the second column, we see the effect of adding ethanol uh, through the bubbler into the reactant stream. Uh, holding W over F fixed, we see that there is a very slight increase in the propanol yield. Nothing to write home to mother about. <coughs> Moving to the third column, we see that taking the ethanol back out and increasing the W over F, the other way to try and increase conversion, leads to a much larger effect, much larger yield uh, in the higher alcohols. Finally, we can force homologation to work, but we need to go to much higher ethanol concentrations, much higher than anything that would be produced uh, in the exit, at the exit conditions from the reactor. At that point, we finally do begin to see some homologation or perhaps condensation setting in. But under the reaction conditions that we expect for the direct synthesis, uh, it appears that homologation, the alcohol does not take place on these
copper cobalt catalysts. So, what we have shown is that the initial idea of building a sequential catalyst with the copper and cobalt each accomplishing their separate uh, operations uh, does not seem to be the case here. Instead, we have behavior which is much more reminiscent of that reported by Sockler and the Netherlands group for the direct synthesis of higher alcohols on chemically promoted rhodium catalysts, namely a modified Fischer trope process, uh, which we will assert or live with, um, <coughs> proceeds by the formation of an alkyl intermediate on the surface, chain propagation by addition of CH2 groups. The termination to alcohols occurs by the supposed to occur by the insertion of CO uh, into that alcohol. The two comments I think we can add to uh, the community's understanding of this reaction at this point are the last one I had mentioned, namely that the homologation reaction does not work, so that is not to deny the, alcohol, the alkyl CO insertion channel, rather that tells us that the reverse reaction of alcohol absorption to get back to the alkyl uh, surface intermediate uh, does not, will not take place on this catalyst. And secondly, that the selectivity for the alcohol termination step, proposed to be the CO insertion, is a function of the reaction conditions. So in principle, by controlling the CO2 or water concentration and calculating the effect, the extent of conversion in your reactive design equation, you can uh, include the selectivity terms uh, in that design equation. To offer a few comments about where I think this is going, I had mentioned that the activities that we're seeing are similar to that reported by the uh, Dow group for mole disulfide and the IFP, so that I think uh, there, is, there is room for fundamental work. We did see that for the co-precipitated catalyst, the TPD results but we're not as clear as we would have liked, so that I think there is, in, in fact, still some opportunity for catalyst by design work here, uh, and in fact, we're interested in looking at novel preparation techniques for obtaining better characterized and better controlled distributions of uh, copper and cobalt on surfaces of these catalysts. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people, of course, who did the work, David Roberts, now with Schlumberger, and two visiting scholars, Mr. Pan Wei Zhang, Mr. Cao Rong. This report was, uh, this work was supported by the U.S. Department of Energy. Thank you. Time for the claim for this.